we are continuing with our uh, lessons with our session today is the fourth uh, session and we are continuing with the uh, definition of a concept that forms the background to the understanding of the form, uh, uh, forms of government the organization of government because unless we we do this properly you may not we may not uh, be able to really understand uh, when we go to the nitty-gritty of the of, of, of the of the of the topic of the subject today we are focusing on uh, the meaning of separation of powers what is the meaning of separation of powers separation of power simply uh, uh, is derived from the activities of government derived from the fact that activities of government are, are, are compartmentalized are, are, divided, are classified into three main organs uh, the executive the the legislature and the judiciary what it means that you have three branches that conduct government activities day-to-day -day activities these three branches wherever the MDS may, may be whatever the MDM must be must fall under these three categories that's the executive the legislature and the judiciary the executive as you all know is concerned with implementing policies and programs of the government while the legislature is concerned with the making of laws is the law making arm of government and the judiciary adjudicate decide on uh, matters that may be brought before it the theory of separation of powers the implication is that each arm of government has specified duties and responsibilities specified functions to perform each arm of government is supreme in its own sphere is important in its own right according to one of the early uh, theorists on separation of powers, Montesquieu. He, this theory of separation of uh, powers, he said, guarantees liberty and avoid tyranny and avoid domination. What it means in effect is that you have activities of government conducted by different arms of government so that it is better and more uh, 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 cost effective instead of concentrating the activities of government on one person or on one uh, organ the activities are, are shared among three organs of government to avoid tyranny to avoid excessive uh, use of power and uh, which ultimately leads to abuse of power but the theory has been criticized on many grounds one is that in reality there is no absolute demarcation of powers because in the day-to-day -day running of government if you do that you will ground the uh, uh, government into a hold the government the activities of government are not that compartmentalized as it is uh, uh, assumed in the theory as it's supposed to be and uh, assumed to be in the, in, the, in the theory what it means in effect is that all the arms the three arms the executive the legislature and the judiciary they are all independent interdependent no uh, single arm is dependent of the other no this is not independent of the other they work in harmony they coordinate they work together because if unless they do that the activities of government will not will not be able to 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 to, to smoothly uh, be carried out so in effect one of the serious criticism is that there is no absolute demarcation no absolute class classification you discover that the executive need the legislature the legislature also need the executive and that is also applicable to the judiciary so the 
result is that the organs cooperate with each other so that unless that is done the aim of government to maintain law and order to provide social services will not be achieved if you say the executive okay go your way do your own uh, implementation of this thing without the legislature the laws the, the the law making body supporting it it will not work you see the executive also say okay a legislature go your way do your law making uh, business without the support of the executive it will not work and so also the judiciary so in the for example in the presidential system of government you will now see that there is need for that harmony there is need for that coordination among the three arms of government the president for example he sends to the to the legislature the president is the head of the executive in the presidential system like nigeria or america the president sends uh, names of appointment as it is enshrined in the constitution like the ambassadors like ministers like high court judges he sent these names to the legislature the legislature screens them the legislature screens them to ensure that yes they live above board yet they are worthy yet they are worthy of appointment at the same time the legislature also will require the cooperation of the president especially when it comes to issue of a fund the executive co uh, controls the fund because minister of finance or the office of the accountant general is under the executive and the legislature they need money they need fund to be able to perform their duties well so they also need the cooperation and the, uh, the support of uh, mr president who is the head of the executive the same thing the judiciary also they lobby the legislature when it comes to issue of appointment because the mr president sends the list of appointment to federal court or to supreme court to the, the assembly the national assembly in this case the senate so it is necessary for the judiciary also to have a harmonious working relationship with the legislature because the legislature also has control over them the legislature can turn uh, down the, uh, 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 the the nomination and and it it it, it, uh, it, it, it will stand on the other hand uh there are some arguments also that among the three arms of government the legislature is the most important i have some reservations here this is subject to a lot of debate they are saying those who belong to this school of thought they believe so because the legislature has the power of appropriation power of appropriation means there is no single cobble single naira that any arm of government will spend or can spend without the due approval of the legislature both the house of reps and the senate so in that case some school of thought rightly or wrongly believe that the legislature is the most important but again at the same time you discover that like i said earlier on the legislature also needs the executive because even though they have the power of appropriation even if they appropriate and the money is not released it becomes a problem so for them to get the money the release of money is appropriated they need the support of the executive also so if you see uh, if you look at it in that uh, from that perspective you discover that no single arm of government is, uh, 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 is, 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 is important than the other they are equally important because they perform equally important roles and responsibilities to ensure that the aim the goals of the state uh, is achieved you have an, another addition that is very important you see like uh, Udo Uso said that government is not a machine but a living thing take for example you as a living human being you, 
all your parts are important. All your, your parts are interdependent. No single part of your body is independent, is dependent of, of, of the other. No, they are all dependent on each other. So no single thing is independent. Say the arm. You say without your leg, you, you, can, you, can, you can't function. Without your eye, you can't function. So they depend on each other. That is how, you, from the perspective you want to see, to understand the uh, importance of the three arms, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. You see, the next thing that, in the strict sense of the word, there is no absolute separation of power. I, I said it earlier on. I need to reemphasize this. There is no absolute separation of power. What is required is the need for cooperation, the need for coordination among the three arms of government. One of the scholars said that the principles of separation of powers is simply an affirmation of the application of economic principle of division of labor in government governmental organization. That means if you, the basic uh, principles of uh, economics, uh, that is division of labor, uh, where you have uh, everybody has in, having its own roles and responsibilities. That is how uh, Chakravati, for example, uh, see the issue of uh, the principles of separation of power. That means every organ has its own role to play. Every organ has its own responsibility as enshrined in the constitution. But at the same time, you are not, uh, it will not be fair, uh, you will not be able to understand the workings of government if you look at it in that light. The most important thing here is to look at it as a, an organic uh, 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 union where the three arms work together, the three arms work in harmony and in, in, uh, in support of each other. So, uh, the questions, uh, we have two questions. You can answer one, explain the theory of separation of powers. How far has this, this theory been translated into practice in Nigeria? Or oh, discuss the theory of separation of powers and explain why it is desirable for the activities of government. That is the question. Thank you very much. We now go to the next session. Theory of social contract. Social contract a theory is very important. It forms also a very important background to our understanding the course. That's the organization of government, how government are organized, the forms of government. Uh, the theory is very important because it gives you insight into the roles and responsibilities of the state, the roles and functions and responsibilities of the citizens in this, within the state. There are so many write-ups about this uh, uh, theory of social contract. Uh, the origin itself is, gives us the background of the theory of the origin of the state itself. Like I said, because the state, if you cast your mind back to our earlier uh, sessions, discovered I we define the state as that entity that occupies a territorial uh, 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 place with sovereignty, with government. So for uh, you to understand the concept of state properly, you need to, in social science, in political science, for example, the theory of social contract is always mentioned so that it gives you that insight, give, gives you that background of the origin of the state. In the theory, the implication is that it explains the origin of the state. And secondly, it attempts indirectly to define the relationship between the ruler and the rule. It is thus a theory about the origin and nature of the state. You have two important uh, points to note here. One, the theory seeks to uh, explain the origin of the state. And secondly, it attempts to indirectly define the relationship between the ruler and the rule, between the citizens and the government. Uh, government is just an instrument of the state. 
So it is important to note that uh, this relationship uh, between the citizen and the government defines the reason for the existence of the state itself. You have early proponents of the theory, which includes Hobbes, John, uh, John Locke, and uh, Rousseau. Uh, the theory ascribed the origin of the state to a contract entered into by men living in a state of nature where there was no law and order. You see, you, the origin of the theory is derived from the fact that men in earlier times, there was no government. They were just living in a state of nature. There was no government. So, with time, men discover that there was that need for them to enter into a contract, into agreement, into a protocol, memorandum of understanding between them and the state so that law and order will be maintained. Essentially, what the theory is saying is that before the emergence of the state, men lived under conditions described as state of nature and controlled by any laws of human prescription. That time, during the state of nature, there was no law. There was no either written or unwritten. There was no law. Everybody was unto himself or to herself. So it was a state of chaos, state of uh, 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 uncertainty. You know? So there was need for people to come together to say, okay, we, we, we can no longer stay under the, uh, uh, in this condition. There was need for us to come together as civilization moved, as people progress uh, in their lives. So, uh, in such a society, men were guided by regulation prescribed by nature itself, and as such, the laws were not written. The state of nature was very inconvenient for, for many reasons, and people had to enter into voluntary agreement, which transferred into the protection of all against possible attack of each. What it means is that the state of nature, it was a lawless society. It was, if, as you go ahead, you see, might was right. You, as a member of society, somebody who is stronger, somebody who is bigger than you, can just come attack you, get your, confiscate your property, uh, get you out of your house, without any, you, don't, you have nobody, nowhere to report to. Because might then was right. He was bigger than you. He was stronger than you. So he could come. It's the same thing. Societies. A, a small society was living at the mercy of the bigger ones. Because the bigger ones could attack the, the, the small ones at, at, at any time. Without any, 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 any hindrance. And nobody could challenge her. Because there was no authority. No central authority to challenge that uh, uh, action. Yes. So, you see, the idea then behind the social contract was that since we could, not, we could no longer continue to live in this type of uh, situation, chaos, situation of chaos, situation of lawlessness, there was need for us to come together. There was need, uh, to in, need for us to enter into a contract with a central body that will be able to take care of uh, our security, that will be able to maintain law and order, so that we will now uh, have laws, man-made laws. These laws will replace the natural laws that uh, uh, existed. And so, the beginning of the man-made laws, the beginning of the realization that, yes, we need to come together under one authority, give rise to what you call government, give rise to the, the meaning of the state. There was therefore that central organization called the state and that central organ of the, uh, that state, the government, to protect, to bring out laws and order that will protect uh, life and property. The city proponents of the of the of the uh, theory, like I said, 
Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau all have their different uh, perspectives about the state of nature. But they were one. They were all in a unanimous that the state of nature and the contract marked the beginning of political organization by terminating the state of nature. Uh, the first of the theories that we are going to consider is by Thomas Hobbes in his Leviathan. He was precise about the state of nature. He said the state of nature was a state in which people lived in constant war, in which people, mankind, had no laws or any kind of justice at all. According to Hobbes, the state of nature is solitary. You are living on your own. You had no or you have little or no relationship with uh, other members of the society. You are on your own. Poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Hobbes, according to him, describe the state of nature as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Short because anybody, a, a bigger somebody, society, or like I said, might was right. Somebody who is bigger than you, somebody who is stronger than you, can come and attack you. And you have no, nobody to co complain to. You have nobody to, 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 to run to to, to, to save you. So the state of nature was really brutish, was really nasty. In the state of nature, might was right, as human life was characterized by force and fraud. Human life was characterized by force. You use force to acquire whatever thing you want to acquire, either wealth or property. If you feel you have uh, somebody who is... Uh, is there with some property, is there with some money, and is not strong as, as you are, you can attack him or attack her and collect whatever you want to collect. The state was intolerable by, for men, and they have to enter into voluntary agreement. This state, like I said, was inconducive, was intolerable, was not conducive for human life. They were not, people then were not happy, so they, had, they have to enter into agreement. They have to enter into agreement. That's what he said. According to Hobbes, men met together and enter into agreement by which they establish an authority to which they irrevocably and unconditionally surrendered all their rights. Men came together to enter into agreement and they surrender their right to government, to a central body. Okay. We want to be loyal to you. We are surrendering, surrendering our rights and liberty to you on condition that you protect our rights and, 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 and uh, responsibilities also and our property too. You, in, in, the, in the event of any attack, you come to our aid. The authority or the established might be a single person or an assembly vested with unlimited powers. Hopes what he is saying here, okay, we have entered into agree agreement with you. The agreement can be entered with, with one person, a very strong king, for example, who they feel can protect them. They enter into agreement with that king, so with a view to protecting their lives and property. Or you have a group of persons coming together to form a government. And this government now decide to protect life and property. So these people now uh, decide that, okay, we are entering into agreement with you with a view to protecting our life and property. And you protect our, uh, uh, and we are surrendering our liberty to you. My implication, the ruler is the outcome of the contract and did not a party to it. And therefore cannot be bound by the terms of the contract. The, the ruler, what he's saying here, the implication here is that the ruler was not a party to uh, the contract, and so he cannot be held responsible for any breach of the part of the agreement. 
the people cannot go against the ruler or the state because this is this will tantamount to violation of the terms of contract, which will be counterproductive as it means going back to the state of nature. If the people uh, go revolt or go against the the ruler, since the ruler was not part of the contract, that is tantamount to uh, violation of the terms of agreement. And the ruler will say, okay, since you've uh, decided to breach the contract, I, I, will, I will no longer protect life and pro your life and property. So the people will go back, the society will go back to state of nature. The theory established both the state and the government. So what it means is that both the state and the government was established by this contract, this social contract, by the agreement. According to Hobbes, men have two options. Men have two options. Either to submit to the common authority or to relapse to state of nature. Men have two options. Either to submit to the common authority to government by implication or to go back to state of nature. These are the two options. And I think the best option is the, the, the former one, to submit to the authority of government. And that is what is uh, 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 in place up to this moment. But it is pertinent to us of what benefit is to men who transfer all their right to one sovereignty. Has this improved their lot in any way? This is subject to a lot of uh, 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 debate, a lot of uh, research. Uh, some people have two options, two views. Some people said uh, the theory of social contract, as far as it's concerned, uh, is not taking care of the uh, interests of the citizens. Like, for example, in like Nigeria now, we have uh, situations where, uh, in spite of the existence of government, people are being attacked, people are being, uh, people's life and property have been taken away with impunity. And so people begin to, to, to question what is the rationale? What is the rationale be behind uh, the social contract between the supposed contract between the state and the people? The state is expected to, by the provision of the constitution, to protect life and property. Another advocate of the social uh, uh, contract is John Locke. He's one of the early philosophers, early, early theorists, who wrote about social contract. He, his book is uh, titled Three Ties on Civil Government. He differed, look, differed a little bit from Hobbes because, according to him, the state of nature is a state of peace, reason, and goodwill. This is different from Hobbes' uh, conception of state of nature, which he said uh, is characterized by war, uh, by force. The state of nature is uh, nasty, short, and brutish. Here, Locke said, no, Hobbes got it wrong that state of nature is characterized by peace, reason, and goodwill. That while you are in that state of nature, when there was no government at all, everybody was at peace with each other. Everybody had uh, good reason to stay together, and there was that goodwill among the, the various inhabitants. Unlike what Hobbes said, that people were fond of uh, killing themselves, people were always at war, he said no, that is a wrong uh, conception of the state of nature. He said, Locke, however, agrees that yes, in the state of law, in the state of nature, there was no written law and no impartial authority to adjudicate upon dispute, which led people to enter into a contract to form a civil society. That is, yes, there was no written law, no central authority. But people said, okay, even though we are in peace, we are in harmony with each other, and we have that goodwill to stay together, there is need for us to come together under one roof, to come together to form a civil society. That's what he introduced this concept of civil society. So men then enter into agreement with the king 
He said, since we have a king, somebody who is the ruler, let us agree to stay under his roof. Let us agree that he should protect us while we surrender our right and liberty to him. So that the king will now protect life and property. You have, according to Locke, two faces of the theory of social contract. One, the formation of civil society. The formation of civil society. That means the coming together of the people under one roof now that we need to form an organization as we call what he called civil society, where we have the king as the head and we surrender our liberty, our right to the king for uh, protection. So, and another is instead of the, the now the uh, formation, the king becomes the, the government. And that is the beginning of monarchy, where you have one person at the head of government, one person that has the power, the three uh, uh, powers of government uh, in him alone, the executive, the monarchy, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Here, the monarchy was a party to contact. So he was also, unlike the Hobbes, he, the king or the monarch, was part of the contract. So in the events of the breach of contract, any provision of the contract, the people have the right to depose him. He can be deposed. He can be asked to go away to abdicate because he uh, failed in, uh, in, his, uh, in complying with the provisions of the contract. The surrender of rights in this case was only partial. So not unlike that of Hobbes, where you have total surrender of uh, unconditional surrender of rights and liberty. That of the law was a little bit different. It was partial. Partial because the king was part and parcel of the agreement. And so he had no right, he had no, 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 no option to, but, but to obey the, uh, uh, and comply with the provisions of the, because of the consequences. If he disobey, if he breach any provision, he can, he, 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 he can, he can be deposed. So, clearly, Locke distinguished between state from the government. That he said, the state is different from government. Unlike Hobbes, that he combined the two. So the state is different and the government. Here, Locke said, government is like an agency of the state. The state has the sovereign, the, 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 the supreme authority over and above that government. But government is seen as an agent, as a tool for which the state uses to achieve its aim. The perspective of the two have their drawbacks. Like uh, Chakravarti said, if the theory of Hobbes is carried too far, it will annihilate individual liberty. That means it will destroy individual liberty. If the theory of Locke is pushed to its logical extreme, it will destroy the authority of the state. What it means here is that the destroying the authority of the state means since Locke said the king is part and parcel of the, of the contract, of the agreement, and he dare not breach any provision because of the consequences. The consequences is that he may be deposed. That means you can you are you are inviting anarchy. Unlike Hobbes, that said totally you are submitting your liberty. Men have agreed to come together, submitting their liberty to government. For Hobbes, there is no distinction between state and government. He sees that as the final and supreme authority that has right over and above individuals. And he was not part of the ag agreement. So the government, the people, cannot sack the government. Another, the third theories that we are going to consider this afternoon is that of Rousseau. He published his work in 1762, Social Contract. J. 
just social contract. His idea was to reconcile between the views of the Hob of Hobbes and Locke. Those who said, ah, "What are the two, these two philosophers, these two friends, two, two scholars? What are they saying?" It appears they are in disagreement. They are not; their views are not in harmony. So, as a result of that, he came out with his own version of theory of social contract. He, his idea is to strike a balance, a balance between the authority of the state and the liberty of individual. Take note, a balance, Rousseau felt that for you to be able to understand the state of nature, for you to understand properly the theory, the principles behind the uh, theory of social contract, you have to, there is need for, for you to strike a balance between the authority of the state and the liberty of individual because the two go together. He said you cannot separate one from the other. According to him, to him, the state of nature is idyllic felicity. It's also peace where people live freely. People were healthy. People were honest with themselves and happy with the state of nature. His own is closer to that of Locke. Unlike Hobbes, that sees state of nature as short, nasty, and brutish. Rousseau said it's in agreement with the principles of Locke that sees uh, peace, harmony, cooperation among the uh, inhabitants of the state of nature. But he said, Rousseau said, the difference in the state of nature started with the civilization as civilization set in. And in particular, there was this uh, introduction that civilization brought about the acquisition of private property in land. The natural equality, men were no longer equal in the society. Men were no longer equal because they now have, uh, some have uh, acquired landed property and they feel you have uh, age, they have age over and above others, lower than them. It's like uh, you liken it to a feudal uh, this feudal system, where you have uh, the lords, uh, the, the the commoners, the lords with the, the owners of the property in the society, while the commoners, the the, the, the were the workers, they had nothing. Uh, so this is the uh, idea of Rousseau that people were living equally, people were living happily, but with civilization and uh, with the advent of the acquisition of property, then this uh, classification between men. Uh, setting. And so it destroyed that state of nature. In particular, he, he blamed the acquisition of private property of land. And so, which destroyed the natural equality among men. According to him, men lived in state of nature as equal. You feel nobody is, we were all equal. But with the acquisition, the civilization, the acquisition of a landed property setting, and people now felt, no, you, I, I, I'm richer than you. I have this, I have that, I have this, I have that. So you, you can look down upon uh, somebody, a fellow uh, uh, citizen, who uh, is not blessed to have these uh, uh, properties. Men, therefore, entered into a contract thus. Each of us puts his own person and all his powers in common in common under the supreme direction of the general will and in our corporate capacity we receive each member as an indivisible part of the whole men entered into agreement remember he introduced uh, Locke introduced civil society Rousseau now introduced general will. 
he introduced, he said, men have agreed to come together under supreme direction, that's supreme authority of the general will. The general will now means the authority, the powers given to that state by all of us so that we now have become one citizen, a citizen under his control, under the, the control of the supreme uh, direction of the, of the general will, of the, of the government. In this case, authority created was not placed in the hands of the ruler, but with the community. That means you have a group of people now called government that take care, take care of your needs and, uh, and, 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 and responsibilities. He, 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 he is in charge of your safety. He is in charge of the safety of other members of the society. The whole people assemble in a mass meeting to express the general will. This general will uh, is not done by one person. The whole, the entire members of the of, of, of the of the community uh, come together to say, "Okay, we are surrendering our liberty. We are surrendering our freedom, our right to you." as a government, so that you protect us. So, the government was created by subsequent legislative enactment with delegated power from the people. So, in effect, whatever powers, whatever functions the government uh, uh, perform is given to it by the people. The people, because people, people the, the general people, they met under one roof and agree that, okay, we are surrendering and we are giving you this power. So in return, for you to protect our life and property, for you to ensure that, yes, our welfare is guaranteed. You have criticism of the social contract theory. In spite of these three uh, uh, perspectives for understanding uh, the theory of social contract, you have criticisms. Uh, one is is historical because according to the studies, no single state in history that was formed by a contract, no single state in history that was formed by contract. Men never lived an isolated life as supposed by this theory. Even today, you don't live an independent and isolated life. No country lives by itself alone. You need the support, the cooperation of other countries. And it's so, it's so it translates to individuals. No single individual. You say, okay, uh, you are a member of a society. You only live in your, in, your, in your domain. Only live in your house. You don't know anybody. You don't relate with anybody apart from members of your family. It's not possible. It's not done. So to that extent, the doctrine of separation of power is unhistorical. You see, the theory again is illogical. The theory presupposes political consciousness, which could not be expected from people living in state of nature. Two, let's be first. The idea of natural right or natural liberty is fallacious, as it was pointed out. The theory proceeds on false assumption that persons before the existence of government could have right to surrender. There cannot be any right un unless there is some authority to protect the right. Contract is the goal and not the starting point in the development of society. You have the theory looks upon the state from a wrong point of view. The, according to here, the state is not like a, a, a partnership. No, it's the state uh, goes far, far beyond the, the principles of uh, partnership as in a joint uh, company. Yes. The story is also dangerous as it, it either inculcates a duty of passive obedience to the ruler or it leaves the state and its institutions at the mercy of individual and caprices which, caprices, which in effect is an invitation to anarchy. Rousseau's uh, general will can be interpreted to mean the will for the general good, which in reality means the will of the people. 
and by implication, majority rule. However, in modern times, although the theory is discarded, you see what people no longer pay particular attention, but it is very important and uh, it will remain so because even though it's not written, you have the constitution of each country, like Nigeria now, has a constitution. The constitution clearly states the duty of the government is to protect life and property. The duty of the government is to provide so one, one, two, two, social welfare amenities that will make life worth living, that will make life meaningful. And at the same time, the government or the state is expecting the citizen also to perform, to be able to be obedient, to obey laws and order, to be uh, 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 good citizens, so that the two, the responsibility of the state is there. You also as a citizen and all the people, the responsibility is also there. The two come together, the two are joined together to ensure that, yes, there is that smooth running of the affairs of government for government to be able to, for the state to be able to achieve the aims and objectives for which it is established. That is the main uh, 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 con uh, concern about the theory, the doctrine of social uh, uh, contract. And it will remain so because no matter the type of government, no matter the form of government, as we will see later, the responsibility of government is to protect life and property. The responsibility of government is to ensure that the welfare of citizens, that is basic needs, accommodation, health, education, these are met. These are basic responsibilities of government. And uh, also, it is important that citizens pay their tax. It is important that citizens have rights. They vote. They vote in government that they feel can take care of their needs. They participate in political activities. They ensure that they obey laws of the land so that there will be peace, so that there will be order. There will not be chaos. So, no matter the uh, 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 perspective from which you see social contract, yes, it will remain to be so, it will remain to be important, it will remain to be an important concept in political science that, yes, you are bound to refer to at any time, at any given time, yes, you feel that government has a responsibility to you and you also has a responsibility to government. Thank you very much. Uh, you have two questions here. Discuss the main argument advanced by the three theories on social contract, Locke, Hobbes, and Rousseau. Or discuss the theory of social contract and mention the salient point of difference and agreement between the social contract theories of Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. Thank you very much. <laughs>